else today. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, good morning. I think we're going to try and get started right at 8 just because we have three presentations and we don't want to keep you guys late today. Um, I'm going to give the first presentation which is uh, an interesting patient I saw in conjunction with the neuro-ophthalmology department here who presented uh, eventually with a central retinal artery occlusion as well as a branch vein occlusion um, and this was all thought to be related to a CNS vasculitis, so something we don't see very often. To begin, the patient presented to ophthalmology through the triage clinic at the end of April, and she had a 24 to 48 hour history of amaurosis fugax, essentially. Um, she had painless blackouts of her vision in the right eye. These lasted for seconds to minutes, resolved completely, um, never affected her left eye, um, and um, this was a new event for her entirely. Uh, she uh, otherwise is a 76-year-old woman. She has an interesting history of a, um, rheumatoid arthritis as well as a discoid lupus. So she has a lot of autoimmune conditions and she's on a chronic low-dose steroid per her rheumatologist for those conditions. You can see on her examination when we saw her at presentation, um, the right eye vision was actually quite good at that time, um, and this is with correction. She didn't demonstrate any uh, afferent pupillary defect or visual field defect by count fingers. Uh, her examination, though, did demonstrate some interesting uh, nerve and retinal findings. There was a possibility of some optic nerve uh, and some hemorrhaging along the superior arcade that was fairly minor, really. Um, so there was uh, nothing obvious, no Holland horse plaque or anything like that uh, that you might look for in conjunction with amaurosis fugax. So uh, her, her ocular exam was not acute, but because she was having these blackouts of her vision, she was, um, there were concerns for vasculopathic risk. And so blood pressure was noted in the triage clinic to have a systolic greater than 190, and the patient even noted that this was unusual for her. So she was sent to the emergency room, and it was communicated to the emergency room that we were worried about uh, cardiovascular and vasculopathic risk factors, as well as possible giant cell arteritis in the um, setting of transient um, monocular vision loss. In the emergency room, though, they just did a CRP, which notably was fairly low and actually decreased from prior um, findings. Her blood pressure was a little bit better than what we had measured at 171 over 80. And um, so essentially, the patient was sent home without further evaluation or consultation with ophthalmology. So the patient then. Um, Represented to ophthalmology uh, a little less than one week later. And unfortunately, at that time, she told us that on the morning of April 26th, which is the day after she originally saw us in triage, she had sudden painless vision loss again in her right eye, but this time, unlike the previous times, it didn't return to baseline. Uh, in fact, she noted no improvement or change the time of that vision loss had no trauma precipitating either the transient monocular vision loss or this permanent vision loss, and she denied any other neurologic uh, or health changes. So a little bit more about her past medical history. In addition to the discoid lupus and the RA that we mentioned, she's been diagnosed with Meniere's. She has anemia of chronic disease, hypertension. She has a history of TIA by report and a possible leaky heart valve, again, by patient report. She's hypothyroid, she has a high hyperlipidemia, and she's osteopenic. So her past ocular history, she's pseudophagic, but no history of any sequelae of autoimmune conditions in the eyes by patient report. And she's been followed here by Dr. Mamelis for general eye conditions and has never been noted to have any uh, intraocular inflammation, et cetera. So she's on a chronic low-dose steroid, as we mentioned, prednisone, five milligrams daily per her rheumatologist, and that's for presumably RA control. Um, she's also on other medications per her medical history, but nothing that um, would be pertinent necessarily to her findings. She has no medical options and no pertinent. 
So at her follow-up visit, unfortunately we noted now from 2020 she has light perception vision in her right affected eye. And you can see she has quite a big uh, relative afferent pupillary defect now in this eye. Uh, on her uh, slit lamp and dilated findings, um, you can see that her eye's fairly quiet. There's no inflammation to suggest uh, any uveitic component. Uh, and then her dilated examination was different than previous exam in that while there's still in her right eye, she now has um, a 360-degree swollen optic nerve. Um, it's not as well documented in this photo, but she also demonstrated a cherry red spot on this exam, as well as some box carring. The other eyes you could see looked fairly normal and had baseline vision. So some additional pertinent history for her and, and some of the initial plan. She was scheduled for a temporal artery biopsy due to concern for possible giant cell arteritis and her steroids were increased to 60 milligrams daily. But in terms of her review of systems for temporal arteritis, it was fairly negative outside of what she would already be expected to have chronically from the RA and the discoid lupus. And then um, in thinking of embolic uh, factors or vasculopathic factors, um, she has a stated history of possible aortic stenosis or leaky valve, but no stated history of atrial fibrillation or plaquenil use. They re I put that in there because I was so surprised by that. <laughs> yeah. This was confirmed by her family. All right. Um, so, 76-year-old Caucasian woman, she has RA and discoid lupus, and she's presented now with painless sudden vision loss in the right eye after multiple ep episodes of amaurosis fugax, and her exam demonstrates significant optic nerve edema, pallor of the um, right eye, focal interretinal hemorrhages, and a cherry red spot. So our differential diagnosis here, it seems like she has quite a bit going on, and this is kind of what we were thinking of initially, and then I'll go through some studies we did to narrow this down, but she could have ischemic injury to her optic nerve, she could have um, any number of vascular blockages, either venous or arterial, she could have a primary optic nerve problem, optic neuritis, this could be sequelae of malignancy or um, uh, infection, uh, and it is fairly unilateral, so even though it doesn't fit completely, you could think about uh, intraocular mass. So to narrow this down, we did a fluorescein angiogram, and this was at her second presentation uh, when she had poor vision. And you can see here, after um, consultation with retina, we determined that um, we were correct in, in our assumption that this is a quite delayed arterial filling here. Um, you can see the times noted, and this is the uh, laminar phase you're just getting to at about 48 seconds. Uh, so there's quite a delay, but you can see as you go to the later um, time points that eventually there is filling, um, and importantly, you don't see any um, leakage or evidence of any vasculitis around the vessels. Uh, that was one thing we were looking carefully for, but even at the later time points, that wasn't present. And you can see com that was her right affected eye, and you can see compared to her left eye, it, um, there is no evidence of uh, any abnormality. This uh, area here has been chronically noted as kind of an atrophic spot, likely related to some macular degeneration. And so we also performed a, a macular OCT, and which demonstrates essentially in the right eye that there's some edema um, there nasally to the fovea um, compared to a otherwise fairly normal, possibly a little thinned um, left macula. And uh, we also obtained some imaging. So the first thing we did was get an MRI, and I, it's a little dense here, but to highlight um, some of the pertinent findings, they thought perhaps there was a recent infarct, perhaps the distribution suggested a central embolic event. 
Um, uh, component of a microvascular ischemia was also possible, and then they also, again, chronic, uh, comment on chronic microvascular changes. But to clarify this, and this was really the most important um, imaging modality, uh, the patient underwent a cerebral angiogram with Dr. Wild in the neurology department, and instead of suggesting uh, an embolic phenomenon, as you might um, think of with for example, a cherry red spot and possible central retinal artery occlusion. In fact, um, he felt that there were mini vessel uh, luminal irregularities and that this was compatible with a vasculopathy like a vasculitis. But we had searched and thought about, you know, um, a retinal vasculitis and didn't feel like we found any evidence of that on her exam or I was completely quiet. Even on fluorescein, there wasn't any evidence of a retinal vasculitis. So this was. Uh, surprising to us, but it still did explain her presentation to some extent. So um, to kind of go back to what we were thinking then, um, based on the uh, additional data that we have, we concluded in conjunction conju with neurology and retina that this patient likely had both a retinal artery occlusion and a branch vein occlusion in the setting of a cerebral or CNS it didn't involve the retina and the retinal vasculature. So just a brief word about um, some of the things that this patient presented with and, and um, when you see a patient presenting with this, just kind of the um, uh, take home points of what to do. So amaurosis fugex, as we all know, sudden painless temporary vision loss lasting two to 10 minutes and followed by complete recovery. Um, there's an actual amaurosis fugex study group that came out with this um, table here of causes of monocular blindness that's transient. And you can see, we think commonly about embolic phenomena. This patient would fall more into a hemodynamic um, phenomenon, phenomenon, and then idiopathic. So it's really um, a broad differential. And there was an interesting study that just came out in Retina this month that they actually, it's the only one I found where they actually looked at the outcomes of, for people who presented with amaurosis fugax and what they ended up having. And it was interesting to me that it seems like the most common thing was either the CR, was the um, CRVO with the ciliar retinal artery occlusion, which was, that's just, not something I would have guessed. I would have thought maybe CRVO or CRAO, um, but relatively these were um, less common in their study group, at least. But there, there isn't another study group to compare this to. This is the first of its kind. But I think that this is good in just thinking of what could it be uh, and then how do we work up the patient. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So. For a central retinal artery occlusion, as in this woman, um, we all are aware that the um, central retinal artery is off the ophthalmic, which is off the internal, um, and that clinically when we see these patients, we classically think about a cherry red spot um, given the infarcted and pale retina, but it, this isn't always present if the cilio uh, retinal artery uh, circulation is intact. And the patients we think about presenting with this, they're usually a little older. They usually have vasculopathic risk factors and cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, um, vascular disease. In younger patients, um, we think more about um, coagulopathies and um, it would be more important to work these up uh, in a patient that, who didn't have other underlying risk factors. And then um, this is, an important point for amaurosis fugax as well as central retinal artery occlusion that there is an association with giant cell arteritis and that is uh, potentially blinding in the patient's other eye and so it's important to really uh, make sure that that's not the cause of their symptoms. So in thinking about the workup, um, exclude arteritic cause and that classic done with uh, ESR, CRP, and um, potentially That's been included, you would modulate their vascular factors and the sources. We saw 
looks at this path to see uh, what the potential cause of their artery occlusion was uh, and potentially hypercoagulable factors. And then in managing these patients, there's an acute, a subacute, and a long-term um, thought process. Acutely, there have been a number of uh, modalities tried to uh, increase circulation through the central retinal artery um, that we've talked about previously in other um, conferences, digital massage, um, carbon dioxide therapy. But these are not very efficacious. Uh, I know Trent had a case of a patient who they actually did um, coil and remove the embolus, and she got a little bit of vision back recently. So, but she was uh, presenting very acutely within the first six hours of her uh, onset. And so, um, acutely, uh, you can think about some management strategies, but uh, the efficacy is low. Subacutely, though, you have to follow the patients and. Uh, ensure that they don't develop sequelae like neovascular complications to the eye. And um, long term, you think about uh, modulating their overall risk factors as you've identified in their workup to ensure that they don't have a similar event in their other eye, either from an arteritic cause or uh, embolic or non arteritic. So, briefly, branch vein occlusion, as also we uh, noted in our patient. Uh, these are the noted risk factors for branch vein occlusion. Diabetes was not an independent risk factor. Um, initial management is directed at modification of the underlying risk factor. Subsequent management is directed towards the sequelae, such as ocular neovascularization and macular edema. The gold standard has been laser photocoagulation for macular edema, as well as PRP for neovascularization. But um, this is a nice review that uh, was out somewhat recently summarizing some of the more recent trials, um, as we have all seen in our retina clinics, we're starting to inject these patients um, what, rather than waiting three months um, to treat their macular edema. And you can see that um, many of the, these strategies of injecting steroid versus anti-VEGF agents do show efficacy with people gaining more than 15 letters with some of these trials, for example, this trial here. So. Um, this is kind of shifting the paradigm of how we treat these, but I think from a um, perspective of someone who this patient is presenting to and you're not always a retina specialist, it's important to kind of identify the risk factors, understand what the treatment is um, and what the sequelae could be and refer, as well as help the patient to modulate their risk factors. So in terms of our patient, one month after the initial vision loss in her right eye, um, we saw her uh, in follow-up. And her course had been that she was hospitalized with the neurology service for three days, uh, undergoing the workup and uh, dosing of high-dose uh, steroids through IV. She um, tolerated this well. She's continued now on oral steroids, awaiting assistance from rheumatology for further immunomodulatory therapy. Um, but her vision is relatively poor and stable. Her APD is stable, um, and she's now de demonstrating pallor of her optic nerve. The swelling has subsided. And I think this is frozen. Oh, okay, so her hypercoagulable workup um, that we did in this uh, interim of one month demonstrated um, no other um, risk factors that we were unaware of that, that would change our management strategy, and you can see all of them here. Um, and so you can see that she did have a negative temporal artery biopsy. We didn't feel like she had giant cell arteritis. Uh, and then other um, autoimmune risk factors and as well as infectious risk factors were worked up and nothing was found. So in consultation with rheumatology and neurology uh, and after all of these studies uh, were back, we determined that in fact it was likely an autoimmune mediated cerebral vasculitis that was the cause of this. And this is very uncommon. I thought it would actually be more common. <laughs> But when I looked in, I, it seems like it would be, but um, when I looked into the literature, um, just cerebral vasculitis in the absence of uh, retinal 
vasculitis, causing um, retinal uh, vascular blockages is not very common. And this is a slide borrowed from this publication. But essentially, they're just summarizing what you can see um, in these different uh, inflammatory autoimmune conditions uh, in the setting of CNS vas vasculitis. And I mean, this one notes uh, possible central retinal artery occlusion and um, possible branch retinal artery occlusion. But even what's postulated really um, doesn't cover what we saw. I did find a couple of case reports. So the, the first one is really most like what we saw, branch vein occlusion followed by central retinal artery occlusion. This person did have an inflammatory autoimmune condition, but not RA as it, uh, or uh, lupus as with our patient. But they do describe the same uh, findings. Uh, and secondly, this publication, uh, this was more of a venous blockage, actually, rather than an arterial blockage. But it was interesting because this patient did regain some vision uh, after plasma exchange and, and uh, significant immunosuppression and modulation. So this is fairly rare. The treatment is not at all uniform. Um, and uh, I think that kind of brings us to how we manage our patient and how we should be thinking about patients with amaurosis fugax. So again, well, you think, you know, if someone presents with this, you think about what it could be, and this is kind of a nice summation of uh, what to think about. And then um, where do you go from there? Well, you can think about um, always an arteritic cause. I think that's the biggest thing to rule out just because it could affect potentially vision in both eyes. Um, but then also importantly, thinking about uh, embolic factors, uh, as this is the, the, um, often the most common cause, um, thinking about looking at the uh, heart or the carotid arteries for a source of embolus, those are very important things to be done in conjunction with their internist. And then um, the thing that I took away from this really was that in somebody with um, an unusual history, multiple autoimmune conditions, even in a quiet eye. We thought with a quiet eye that um, we, we were thinking of other things, more common things for amaurosis fugax because the eye was quiet. So what I took away is that even in a quiet eye, um, it's good to consult with rheumatology and neurology to make sure that there's no um, other inflammation in the patient that could be causing this in the CNS, for example. So in a patient with uncommon risk factors, uncommon things can happen, I guess. And that's what I took away from it. Does anyone have any comments about how they would have handled it differently with this patient? I think the thing that I most disliked about this case is that she presented with 20-20 vision. And the next time we saw her, she had LP vision. And I just, I didn't think that there was anything that could have been done differently in her, given her ocular findings, that would have changed the outcome. But I guess, does anyone have any comments on that? Amaurosis reject. Thank you. Dr. Warner.